everybody. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule for what's going to be a very exciting discussion. I'm honored to be here today with some of my friends and colleagues here. First, Paul Ballou, who's the Chief Data and Analytics Officer for the NFL. Andy Kaufman, who's the Senior Vice President of Marketing Strategy and Science at the NFL. And my colleague, Rich Nanda, who's the best-selling author and the leader of the Deloitte Strategy and Analytics Practice. My name is Ramya Morali, and I'm a principal in Deloitte Strategy Practice. And I've had the pleasure of working alongside Paul and Andy over the last 18 months at the NFL. Welcome to Transform, Rinse, and Repeat, Deloitte's monthly executive conversation series, where we spotlight our client strategies, how to navigate market disruption, and how to drive successful enterprise transformations. I'm going to hand it over to Paul to do a quick introduction before passing the mic over to Andy and Rich. Well, Andy and I could probably introduce each other. We spend so much time together in a good way. Uh, so I'm Paul Ballou, as mentioned, I'm the Chief Data and Analytics Officer for the NFL. I've had a 35-year career in data and analytics, seems like yesterday. Uh, I would say that throughout that journey, one of the great joys that I've had is to work with great partners. And I actually have one of my best partners right now, and that's with Andy. Uh, data and analytics was born in marketing. If you go way back in my career when I left government service, it started there. And I'm very thrilled to say that if you go through my career, that it's kind of come back around to that, where our ability to connect with individuals, customers, fans, in our case, on a personalized level at scale has been my life's professional pursuit. And now we're making it come to life. So delighted to be with you today and delighted to be with Andy. As we like to say, I'm a data guy who thinks he's a marketer. Andy's a marketer who thinks he's a data guy. So we're going to kind of play off each other throughout the day. Absolutely. Um, it's it's such a pleasure. I mean, as Paul said, it's a pleasure to be here, but also a pleasure to work alongside him and, and the team at the NFL. Uh, my name's Andy Kaufman. I, I'm in the middle of my second season at the league after spending 25 years in the travel industry with brands like Marriott, Expedia, and Disney. Uh, and and it's as I, as I said, it's a true honor to be here, but an honor to steward um, real industry leading innovation with this brand every day. And we'll, well, I know we'll get into it, but it's it's some pretty awesome stuff that we're doing and truly industry leading. All right, and I'm, I'm Rich Nanda, and uh, I'm a uh, 20 plus year consultant to consumer brands, all in the, the growth um, space, increasingly around digital and analytics, uh, get to run our strategy and analytics business, um, and I'm a lifelong Bears fan, so today's conversation is extra special. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Audience members, I want to remind you that this is a live conversation and we welcome all of your questions. Um, we're going to, the panel's going to address some select questions and we'll certainly um, pick some questions out of the chat. But just, you know, as Paul and Andy said, this is such an exciting opportunity to spotlight the NFL and how they are really leading um, in this transformation journey. So we're going to kick things off with a video. Eve, Eve, Eve. Take it to the house, kid. Cut. Welcome to the TikTok tailgate, everybody. <laughs> I like oh, Mark's God. mustache. He calls that dance the gritty. We got the old the gritty dance going on. Who's back, you good? Let's go. I worked with Bucks in the NFL to get you and your family Super Bowl tickets this year in LA. Everybody is a role model. Everyone. He focused on police community relations, education, and economic advancement. I want more compassion, you know, in the next generation dealing with mental health. Wow, 
Wow. What an awesome video. It kind of gives me goosebumps to watch it. And it also it obviously gets at the heart of the relationship that the league and the clubs have with fans. So, Andy, you were mentioning you've been at the NFL for a couple of years right now. What what has it been like to be part of a brand that has such a deep relationship with its fans? Well, I mean, it's incredible. I mean, just the, the video that you just watch, you can't help but get, I think, as you said, goosebumps. But you just get pumped up. I like to say after watching that, it's hard to not be so amped up that you want to run through a wall, right? Um, you know, it's one of those incredibly unique opportunities where you can take a passion. I mean, I've been a lifelong NFL fan and to have an opportunity to combine that with professional acumen and capabilities that I, I've been developing for the last 25 years and then to work with partners in a team setting, which remember we are a team sport. So in a team setting like Paul and our IT organization, it's really a dream come true. Uh, you know, we are an incredibly complex business, but also an incredibly powerful and influential brand. And we don't take that lightly. The opportunity not just to entertain people around the game, but then to use the celebrity, the power of the brand, the influence of the brand to make the world a better place is not just something that we take seriously. It's a responsibility that we, 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 we you know, we, we chart, we, we drive every day. And so, you know, this week's a perfect example. You know, we're de debuting a number of programs. We have an annual program called My Cause, My Cleats, um, which every year uh, our players wear custom cleats to raise funds and, um, and honor causes that are meaningful to them. And when you see these stories, and we just had a meeting a, a few hours ago, when you see these stories, it's deeply personal, deeply impactful. You realize what we're doing. Uh, is really to change the world, and it's and it's it's an honor every day. Yeah, it's that's amazing. And so, Paul, let's let's take what Andy was describing it and bring it into the context of the transformation that you you both have been un undertaking. Can you unpack a little bit about the charge that you both have sure. to transform how the league engages with fans? What were some of the imperatives from a business standpoint and a league and club standpoint that brought about the transformation? So when, first and foremost, when we get up in the morning, Andy and I have been kindred spirits since our first meeting. We believe that great brands in a digital world see, know, and engage their customers or their fans meaningfully in context. And that's very important for the league because given the strength of our brand and given our network relationships and so on, that's a great foundation to build from, but the world is also changing. And as the world changes to more of a direct to consumer model, as the world has content being consumed in fragmented ways, as we see these shifts unfolding, it's very important for the league to have that capability to augment its fundamental strengths around the content of the game, the strength of the brand, and all of those things that go along with it. The strength of the brand being driven by the players and the type of the game and, and all of the things we focus on. And to Roger's credit, our commissioner's credit, he sensed this. And, and his initial discussions with me really came back to this of saying, we have to be prepared in this digital world to be able to connect at scale on a personal basis. And that's really what this is all about. Can we see, know, and engage meaningfully in context, do it at scale, and to do so to prepare us for the future as well as supporting today. So when Andy and I get up in the morning, we are focused around making sure our marketing is more efficient and effective today, supporting our clubs throughout all of their use cases, making sure our partners have been validated that their investment with the league has a positive ROI. Mm -hmm. but we're also building these capabilities for a world that five years from now, who knows? And where does D2C ultimately go? And where does the fragmentation of consumption and all the trends that have been enabled by digitization really take us? So that's the imperative, that's the mission. Uh, it's been exciting. And on one end, the real strength we have is we've got this great brand and this great asset and our fans want to engage with us, which is different than some other industries, by the way, Ins insurance in my past life, for instance. So you have that. But then on the other end, as Annie alluded to, we've got a pretty complex organizational structure. We've got ourselves, 32 clubs, partners and so on. And we have to connect all those dots together. Yeah. Yeah, Rich, I know it's music to your ears and mine that the customer, in this case, the fan, is really at the heart of NFL's transformation journey. You know, given your experience, I'd love for you to share a little bit about what you've seen from other clients' digital and transformation journeys when the, it's really focused on improving the experience for the customer. 
Yeah. Well, what what really resonated with me about Andy and Paul's comments is, you know, regardless of what industry you're in, you know, putting the customer at the center um, and acknowledging that, you know, there's a, a mission or a purpose by putting the customer at the center, um, acknowledging that we've gone from this analog world to a much more digital world where context matters um, and, and achieving personalization in context is complicated. Um, and so there's a lot of common denominators between, you know, what the NFL is, is going through here and what companies, whether they're B2C or B2B, uh, have to do as well. And, and companies that get it right, you know, they're very clear about keeping that customer at the center, keeping the mission and the purpose connected to the purpose as, as a North Star, um, and then acknowledging the complexity in the organization, but not getting parallel, uh, parallel by it, right? Making continuous progress um, towards that, that mission and the customer. Yeah. So the work that we have been doing, Deloitte, with the league really began with the fan journey. And again, I think it, it speaks to Rich where you're going. Andy, I would love to hear, tell us a little bit about your vision for the fan journey of the future and how did that work help to strengthen this transformation and how you think about the way that you engage today's fan? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, when we started this journey, as, as, as Paul mentioned, it was kind of kindred spirits from day one. We, 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 we certainly saw needs around data, around technology, around orchestration. Um, but I think what we also agreed to is as, as you put the fan at the center of your activities or become more fan-centric as, as an organization, it's imperative that you have a roadmap to guide you. Mm-hmm. And that roadmap, you know, historically in, 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 uh, in organizations I had worked in, was based off of products or channels or technology innovations or wouldn't it be cool if versus flipping the model around the last few years the fan journey has become paramount and now it has become paramount at the at the league for us in what are the needs of our fans that we are super serving and there's many of them where are their needs that perhaps we are underserving at times where's there friction in their experience and then where are there things that perhaps could be differentiators in the future? So as you lay that out, obviously not all fans are created the same. Not all fans' needs and wants are going to be exactly the same. So it's really imperative that you have not only a lens of segmentation from a historical or demographic or behavioral sense, but also from a value sense to the business. <coughs> and that's where lifetime value starts coming into elements. That's where cross-sell, upsell come in. And, and while, and, and that's where a really a tremendous opportunity has been created for us by understanding the needs, by understanding the products that we offer and start, and now driving experiences that can enable us to activate those needs, not only utilizing the data that we have, but reaching them in the channels or the context that Paul mentioned so that it's an orchestrated experience. You know, I always say right now we're having a conversation And for all the the folks that have dialed in, they're hearing us discuss something. If we pick up tomorrow where we left off, ideally we pick up where we left off, not start over, Mm -hmm. right? Marketing in the past had been starting over each time, (coughs) each channel or each campaign. Now you have these continuous conversations that move a relationship forward and ultimately create more value for the fan. That's monetizable for the league. That's a win-win. Well, and just to build on that for a second, I think as you, as Paul was describing, the NFL's ecosystem is so complex and that, that journey becomes a tool to help the clubs and to help partners and all of the other stakeholders who help to fuel the, the NFL experience, right? It's absolutely right. It's critical, right? And from day one, our, our journey, our mission has been for our fans, for the league, for our clubs, and for our partners and sponsors. Yeah, yeah. So, Rich... You represent the typical profile of an avid fan, one of the segments that we spend time thinking about. As you think about some of the journey that uh, Rich, uh, that Andy's describing, tell, what, what would enrich your experience? What is the thing that you hope this, this transformation unlocks for you? And Rich, yeah, well, I'm taking notes, so be prepared to <laughs> match into your file. I love it. Well, as I, as I take off my consultant hat, um, before I take off my consultant hat, the words that Andy said, orchestrated experience, 
I think are so important, right? That seems to me like the the jackpot, but also, you know, what's so hard um, about getting personalization, right? And as a, as a Bears fan, as I think about orchestrated experience, you know, I've got now a couple kids that are, they've caught the same bug, a uh, teenage boy who's fantasy football, you know, lover. And, you know, our, con- our weekend conversations during the season are 50% about, you know, the sport and fantasy teams. And so I think there's an element of orchestration that includes, you know, friends and family. And I think, you know, the, a real opportunity for, for the league and for brands in, in general is to think about orchestration, not just at the consumer as a unit of one, but as a, you know, as a more socially connected unit. And how cool for brands to be able to take advantage of, you know, those networks um, <coughs> and to consume the product um, together. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what you're describing, Rich, that moment, this idea of cultivating connection and how does the sport and the act of watching and engaging create a sense of community and networking certainly came up as a moment that matters for fans and something that's continuously represents a real opportunity for the league and for all the clubs. Now, anyone who knows the four of us knows we can go deep into a fan experience rabbit hole. But lest we do that, <laughs> come back to the transformation for a second. So, Paul, you know, as you think about what you were describing and breaking down some of the informational silos between the league, the clubs, and c- to collect more data so that you are able to create this single view of the customer and tra- tra- transform the experience of the fan, talk to us about some of the issues that you faced as like related to data governance, security, privacy, like just merging such diversified data and like just seems like a lot to tackle. It was very easy. We just walked in one day, Andy and I sat in a conference room together, whiteboarded it out, and we flipped the switch and tomorrow we went live. Uh, so <laughs> I wish it were that easy um, some days. Uh, I would, anybody going down this path, if you anchor on, you want to see, know, and engage meaningfully in context, always comes back to one key outcome. And that is if you had one customer or one fan, how well would you know them? How respectful would you be of that fan? How detailed in your engagement and impactful in your engagement you would be? So we always anchor back on that. But you're right, to, to get that done requires a lot of heavy lifting. And if you think about the heavy lifting, there's numerous buckets that we you have to get through and we had to get through. So on the data side, the the data side is challenging for multiple reasons that we had to tackle. One is there was no standardization, just like any legacy environment. So you have to deal with all the technical challenges of bringing together disparate data sources. Then you got to multiply that by 32. And in many cases, multiply that by some factor in 32, because most of the clubs didn't have one provider managing their own data assets. So yes, it's been a very, very heavy lift. And in fact, it's been the heaviest lift as it normally is in the first year of the program to deal with the data homologation, the cleansing and all of those things going along with it. I would say in the same regard, in many cases, people underestimate the enabling capabilities that go beyond just data ingestion and curation and transforming and the things that we have to do technically. And that's because there is this area now that's become very important that we put shorthand around, we call it privacy or privacy slash consent. We embrace that from day one because that is an area that you have to get right, not just because of the legal complexities and the compliance issues, but also because the world we're now living in requires us, if we're going to do this right and respectfully of our customer or our fan, to do it with a high degree of transparency. And if they desire to have control, give them control, which is why you see here things such as preference centers and so on. That's been a heavy lift because you have to tackle it at the league level. But once again, we have 32 other entities we have to get aligned. And so we spent a lot of time on this. And if you look at our program structure itself, our program structure has the data piece and and that element to it. It has the marketing technology piece. It has what we call governance, but it's really marketing governance because that has been an area Annie and I had to really drill into. And then not surprisingly, the fourth pillar in this has been privacy and consent and the enabling requirements that go along with it. Very heavy lift. My best advice to anybody who has tackled this, I've had the good fortune of doing this just a couple of times in my career. A couple of times, by the way, with Deloitte, interestingly enough, with you guys with me, is you really need to solidify the roadmap, 
line up the investment, but you need to spend even more time on the change management and the alignment that goes along with this because the alignment is a very, very important part of the journey. It gets magnified a little bit because we have clubs, but I would say other organizations face the same challenge sure. because you're dealing with marketing organizations or sales organizations, or you're global in nature and you got different reporting units and then you got to make sure you're integrated with IT. Uh, so my advice to everybody is some structure along those lines required don't discount the human dimension associated with this. And in fact, Annie and I, a month into this program, set up a cross-functional program team and two months into this program, set up a working team with the clubs, which if we go back and look at that, maybe we were smarter than we thought at the time, uh, but it served us very well to do that. And we've really taken advantage of those groups. By the way, the working teams with the clubs turned into five sub working teams with the clubs and all 32 clubs we put to work and we brought them into the tent from day one because they needed to be in the tent. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think just as you said, Paul, building trust, particularly in these types of transformations that are consumer facing or consumer oriented is key. Rich, how have you seen other enterprises either succeed or to Paul's point, struggle sometimes as they try to build consumer trust on these types of transformation journeys? Well, first I got to give Paul um, and the league a lot of credit because what Paul described is, um, you know, a lot of the best practices right there. Um, you know, sweating the alignment early on, so important, um, setting up working teams with a, a broader set of constituents, really getting that voice of the customer. If it's not direct, it's, you know, the the, the line into the, the customer um, is so important. And, uh, you know, the other thing maybe is just having some fail safes in the, the transformation journey that allow for, um, uh, you know, some speed bumps in the way around trust that don't become monumental speed bumps. So, you know, ha having, um, you know, working teams to manage those speed bumps and react to them in real time be before they fester. Because um, anything that is going to be consumer facing in public, if, if there's a, um, you know, a, a trust issue that um, gets out of control, then, you know, that that becomes a bigger problem than being able to deal with it, acknowledge it, um, and recover from it. And so, you know, at the end of the day, uh, Customers aren't expecting perfection in most cases, right? But they're expecting candidness and transparency that that um, fuels their engagement. Yeah, yeah. And they want to know that the brand that they're engaging with is taking care of them, right? Is is treating the information and the engagement with care. And there's, um, a, so there's a respectfulness to this that I think yeah. sometimes gets lost. And the reason being is that 10 years ago, we really had an environment where we were split in the way we approach customer data. One is the digital natives in many cases made it a requirement to grant permissions to use their services. So they took it to one extreme. The other extreme, you had legacy organizations that were trying to navigate their way through complexities on capturing data and, and conservatism from, in many cases, their legal staff. What I like about where the world's at now is we're trying to find the right balance. And at the center of that balance is understanding that customers are giving us the honor, the privilege of using their data on their behalf. Therefore, we need to be transparent, respectful, and we have to deliver against that promise. Yeah. If you do that, the privacy issues take care of themselves. If you don't do that, the privacy issues become either operationally problematic or legally problematic. And we don't want to do that. No, and you know it's 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 interesting because even when we were, gosh, a year ago, we were working on the mission for this initiative, and we have a mission statement. We we review it with owners, and we consistently go back to it. The very end of it, that's a short mission statement, right? Two three sentences. The very end of it says, "in a in a manner that respects the fan," mm -hmm. and at the time. Not everyone really had, I think, internalized what that meant. When you start playing through consent, when you start playing through frequency management, when you start playing through orchestration, you're now, you're now inserting fan level metrics, opt out rates, engagement rate, not just the positive, but the negatives, mm -hmm. right? And 
enabling best practices across the organization through the data, through what fan behaviors are telling us. And it's kind of a world of data over opinion then that really sets us up for, for success in a way that the fans in many ways are going to dictate the, their own experience through voting yes or no through their behaviors. Yeah. So you, you touched on a good point, Andy, around measurement. So going back to your the lovely example, and this is a question that came from the crowd, so keep them coming. Um, you know, you shared the cause for cleats. Um, my cause, my cleats, yes. Yes, my cause, my cleats um, campaign. How do you think about, how do you measure the impact of something like that? Because obviously in a transformation like this, as you said, demonstrating the impact becomes critical. Like, how do you think about measuring something like that and how that's improving or enhancing the fan experience? Yeah. Uh, so there's a number of ways we do it, but I'll go back to first the brand. There's a aspect that's related to the joy of the game, the excitement of the game. There's a lot of historical football measures there, but the brand is bigger than the game. And mm -hmm. the brand is an association of players, of clubs, of the shield that make up the NFL family. And so we consistently measure on a variety of different fronts, brand health at the, at the league level, club, players, the drivers of that. And what we've also, and what we've been seeing over the last few years is, is fandom drivers are changing. Mm -hmm. Historically, you know, you became a fan of the game through a number of means. You may have played the game when you were younger. Your parents may have been big fans. You may have lived in a city where a team plays in the, in the league. And so your team affinity, your fandom was sort of rooted through generational behaviors. Now that's changing. One, fandom isn't always passed down from a club by club in the same, or from generation for clubs in the same way. Two, uh, fans are becoming fans at times through alternative experiences, whether it's gaming or even social media, at times, clearly the number one driver of fandom is playing the game. So youth, youth football participation and flag are incredibly important. But as you start to associate with the brand, and I'm answering your question, I know it's a long way in. Uh, as you associate with the brand, just like other brands, consumers of today want to associate with brands that share a common belief system with them. And they will create and they will shift behavior and spend and time with brands that are aligned with their belief system. And so it's very important that we um, we represent those. We represent our fans. We represent our, our players and their belief system. And what we've seen is in doing so, we've seen significant increases in fandom as a result of that. Mm -hmm. And that's where the joy of the game and what we call transcending the game really go, work hand in hand. And ultimately, it all moves um, the, the brand health up and to the right. Yeah. Well, and what you're describing is has resonance across so many brands and spaces where a consumer can have an emotional connection with the brand. Right. Like that's certainly true in football, but also um, but also across lots of industries. Yeah, and, you know, Rami, our approach to not only this program, but everything we do for the league does wrap itself around putting discipline in place where appropriate from a measurement standpoint. That's what a good analytics organization does is one of our tasks that we're, we're responsible for. For me, what's been important in the personalization program, what we call the unified view of the fan, is we started with a work stream to make sure that we had KPIs and there was discipline. And that that was both in terms of running the program as well as the higher level outcomes that we're looking to achieve with the program. What really helps in this regard, which is to give a shout out to Andy, is that when you have a professional marketer who embraces that, that causes a great partnership because we bring the science, he brings the discipline in consuming and leveraging the science, and then we'll ask questions of us to improve the science. And that's what the joy of the journey is all about. And and in all fairness, Paul, I appreciate that. It, 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 it's quid pro quo. It goes both ways too, right? The partnership's tremendous. And you keep us on our toes too, yeah, in, a, in, in a healthy, respectful way. Same way we respect our fans, we respect each other. It's where teamwork is a paramount value at the NFL. 
and doing so in a way that, you know, it's, it's not ever finger pointing. It's about or how do we collectively make it better? And so for the benefit of the Deloitte team, again, the, the benefit of my career is I've been along around probably longer than most people on this call and seen it through different industries and organizations. It is so critically important that that tight collaboration between the marketing and sales organization and the data and analytics organization is established. Data and analytics was either born in marketing or born in IT. Those are the two parents that generated this modern field that I've had the privilege of being part of. Going back to that connected tissue with our sales and marketing organization is absolutely essential. And it makes it, you're not gonna be successful in this type of program without that tight connected tissue. And it's interesting, Andy and I consider ourselves really good friends because we are really good friends. But what was fascinating for us was that was from the first conversation, we got it. Yeah. But then we've reinforced it during this journey. And that's back to my human message is that we kid about it, but I try to understand life from a marketer's perspective. I'm not a marketer. Andy tries to understand life from a data and analytics perspective. And then we try to get our teams to understand it from each other's perspective. Yeah, and I will say one, while, while Paul and I are, are here talking to you today, there is one critical partner at our table that isn't, and I just want to call it out, which is our IT organization. Right. And, you know, obviously, it's orchestration, it's data, it's technology, it powers all these things. And having a smart partner in that, from marketing technology to the data systems, et cetera, is, is, is critical here. And so I, I kind of view it as a, a bit of a triangle effect yeah. in terms of the collaboration model. Yep. Um, I, I think it's so great that you guys get to collaborate on this journey. I think that it can be pretty lonely if it's just one person at the helm of a transformation. So I think there is there is um, value in that partnership. OK, let's let's press forward. I, one of the things, Paul, you were describing a little bit about how you guys designed the governance around this transformation. I'd be interested. This question came from the crowd. How do you think about the balance of what um, decisions and what work was being managed centrally versus where opportunities were being deployed decentrally and where you were giving um, the club's autonomy to really think about how they used this to their advantage on their own. Yeah. So it's a, it's a great question. It's actually been a question that has chased me for about two and a half, maybe three decades now of how do you strike that balance? And the best way I can describe it to anybody is the model has to have a hybrid component to it that's customized to the organizational dynamics you're in. Um, when you get into an excessive federated model, you never scale. You never get commonality and consistency and all those things. On the flip side, if you try to impose a centralized model outside of a digital native, the immune system kicks in and it rejects the organ in many cases. So you've got to strike that. What we did is... And what we're still doing is we go through the journey of saying, look, certain things are centralized and managed at the league level. We set data standards. The actual golden record sits with us. Privacy is a centralized set of rules that operate under. The clubs still have to execute against it. And so we went down that path in, a, in, a, in the spirit of saying, first and foremost, data is usually an asset that should be managed horizontally. It just doesn't work if it's not. So we, we took it on that approach. Then when you get into the actual consumption or the leveraging of the capabilities, you start moving into a federated role and obviously you're empowering the clubs in a variety of ways. Um, I would say that as you go through that balancing act, Andy and I also had to spend a lot of time talking about the Major League Baseball example because it came up over and over and over again where Major League Baseball went pretty aggressive on centralizing, especially on the outbound marketing communication side. We made the decision that we weren't going to go down that path because we don't feel comfortable with it, but also it wasn't consistent with the organizational dynamics of who you are. So my best piece of advice is a hybrid model is the only model that works, especially when you have a structure like the NFL. But I would say in other organizations I've been in, and then against that, the nature of the hybrid model has to be consistent with the organizational dynamics of the entity you're supporting. By the way, if you if you go back to all my career in automotive, we had a GM, eight very, very, very strong brands. They were independent companies. And by the way, big independent. I mean, Chevrolet at the time was a $120 billion company. 
Well, guess what? If we would have come in and said all the decisioning rights for Chevrolet sat with a central organization, first of all, the general manager of Chevrolet would have who had more power and authority than anybody other than the CEO of the company would have strung me up. So we didn't approach it on that basis. So it's not just the NFL, but it's other organizations as well. Yeah, and, and I and I I couldn't agree more. You know, I come from a, a world of in hospitality. My past company had 30 brands, had a loyalty platform that connected it. We're not unlike that in that, you know, the, the club or the team you're a fan of is on the front of your hat and the shield's on the back. And and the team is is associated with the league in ways that elevates the, the team and vice versa. But what's really critical, if you sort of say, think about this centralization and, 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 and localization piece when it comes to content, when it comes to operating model, when it comes to MarTech, the easy answer is to say we're going to unify the stack. But that's not a realistic answer for organizations that are mature and operating. And so we created a model that layered orchestration on top of existing technology so that you could orchestrate experiences through the data and by providing context into the delivery channels, not by changing all the delivery channel technology, right? Right. It doesn't actually matter who, what tech is sending the email. What matters is the logic for orchestrating for that fan, the personalization of the content and the authoring of that content in an authentic way to connect with that fan. And that's not something you can or should centralize. It, but you it, have to enable a federated, connected, harmonized experience. And it's a great point, Rami. We were with your team, actually, in a conference room, which is about 50 feet from where I'm at, last winter, having that exact discussion. Mm -hmm. Yep. And we landed on this word compatibility. Yeah and became a requirement to drive this forward. And it was one of those moments where I can remember all of us were in that conference room kicking this around to say, how do we strike this balance? Mm -hmm. And then of course it landed into all the work streams around marketing governance. Thank you for your team's help on that too, by the way. And the, whatever it is, Andy, 78 use cases against marketing governance or some numbers. like And the journey again, just reminds us to the principles you're operating on. You want to centralize in ways that you build it once, leverage it multiple times, have good governance, get all those synergies. But at the end of the day, you just can't centralize for the sake of centralizing because you think that that's the expeditious way to scale and drive consistency. It sounds good on paper. The reality is the immune system will reject it. And then on the flip side, I'm not even sure it scales. Even if the immune system didn't reject it, I don't think it scales uniformly across everything you're trying to do. Having said that, my bias is data needs to largely be centralized in one way, shape. It is a horizontal asset that needs to be managed. Yeah. Now, that's self-serving for me to say because I have that role, but my experience says you have to do that. When you get into the actual consumption, once again, that's where it starts to get really, really, really interesting. And that's where Andy and I have actually had to spend a lot of time helping our teams get over that. Because our teams, not having always had as much experience as us, quickly want to go to the, the on paper simple solution is we'll just control everything. Right, right. And it's and then part of that becomes how do you make it so that it makes sense for everybody? And I think what it gets at is the heart of one of the things, Rich, you talk about in your research, which is around the idea of the growth mindset. Right? How do you create the opportunity and how do you make it palatable for everybody? So can you describe a little bit about that and how it connects to some of the things that Andy and Paul are sharing? Yeah, I, this conversation has, has been awesome. I, I think the, the connection between operating models and growth mindset is this, like whether you're a company with a highly engaged fan base like the NFL or a less engaged customer base like an insurer, whether you're a very mature organization like General Motors with these, you know, um, you know very entrenched and powerful brands or, or a, a newer company with less empowered brands, the tensions that we're describing here about what makes sense to centralize data, probably. How do you then empower the, you know, the extended team? Those tensions exist in, in all of those companies. And the, the leaders that are responsible for these programs and transformations that have a growth mindset, which is to say there isn't a one size fits all answer. 
I need to be open to lots of possibilities and then tune into those possibilities. I need to be open to adapting um, based on experiments and what we learn. I need to be open to adapting based upon um, ecosystem of partners that we're bringing to the table. That growth mindset versus a fixed mindset that says, hey, there's just one way to do this. In the discipline in the field we're talking about, you have to have the growth mindset that's more open to possibilities, learning, adapting through experimentation and partners. And Rich, I, if I can build on that, I mean, that's that's the approach we took to the marketing governance that Paul mentioned. I mean, yes, we sat down, we involved all of the clubs. We had a, one of our subcommittees was around marketing governance. We went deep, we did the hard work, we had 77 use cases, we defined rules around audience and, and, and context, and how you amplify between the club and Lee channels and all those things. And instead of pressing the go button, we said, and now we need to go try it. We need to pilot it. We need to put it out in the market. We need to see what works and know what we got right and what we got wrong. And so that's what we're doing right now with seven different clubs, piloting that to say, not only the software, but also the operating model, the content, where do we need to tweak? And before you scale to what we say, all 30 the, to the power of 33, which is 32 clubs plus the league, let's take it out for a spin because guarantee there's some things that really sounded right on paper, but when you put them into practice, need to be tweaked. Yeah. Um, you know, just a last question for you before we wrap. I think just building on what you guys were saying, part of this transformation is both about today's fans but it's also about tomorrow's fans. And, you know, other than Rich's house where everyone's glued to the TV on Sundays, I've, more and more consumers are, you know, looking for bite-sized clips. They're, they're finding alternative substitutes for how they spend their time. They're using devices in different ways. Paul, how do you think about using this transformation as a way to um, address the technolo technological disruption that's happening in the marketplace and how you stay relevant for tomorrow's fans? So we have other, analytic teams that are part of my organization. They spent a lot of time on this. In fact, we were with it today. We've got this new concept that we're pioneering called NFL as a platform, which looks at how much share of mine we're consuming and, and how that's being consumed and, and so on. So those are information elements into this. But having said that, at the core of this particular journey of one-to-one, -one, our constant ability is to invest in getting to understand you better see, know, and engage. Sometimes in the journey, you lose sight of the no, because everybody gets up and says, oh my God, I got to get a common identifier. I got to bring my data together. I got to cleanse it. I got to do all that. And then we quickly want to go to engage because once I have all this data, I want to go use it. I want to go play and I got it. My passion is heavily around, I want to get that no right. And I want to get that no right with is much precision as possible and with the elimination of latency to the greatest degree possible. That's my version of Moore's law, precision up, latency down. And so we are committed data acquisition, third-party data sources, continuous exploration, continuous testing and learn, build all those feedback loops going along with it because we do know that the shift away from linear programming is far more intense with those are in the age of 35 the other part of my shop spends an incredible amount of time on this issue. We know that things like fantasy, for instance, are critical enablers for getting them engaged. By the way, we probably underestimate it. But we have to learn all of that. We've got to apply it, and then we have to keep this flywheel going. Yeah. Uh, because the world is not stable, or in this case, in relationships. I would point out to, to everybody just a few historical fun facts on this. And that is in 1970, one gigabyte of hard drive space would have cost you a quarter of a billion dollars. Today, it costs you 10 cents, that one tenth of one cent to get it right. Just pause for a moment. Just If you just reflect upon what that technological transformation then gets transformed in terms, in terms of what we do every day and how we do it, it's mind numbing. It's absolutely mind numbing. And for any of us to assume that we can predict five years, 10 years from now, we're gonna get it wrong. So what you have to do is build systems in place that allow you to listen and to monitor the pulse and understand those changes and then test your way through it. Because even once you understand them, if you don't test, you're still going to get it wrong because the assumptions that you're making are still based upon history alone. 
So that's my long-winded soliloquy of saying this thing is not going to be done ever. We don't want it to be done ever. Yeah. And the joy that Andy and I have is, is we have a desire of continuous curiosity. And that continuous curiosity is what's going to propel us forward. And yeah. we'll see where this takes us. The goal that the commissioner had with us is have optionality. So we're ready, come what may. Yeah, and, and Rami, and you you know this, but for for the group on the on the webinar, you know, our fan journey doesn't only look at our channels. No. It looks at the channels that our fans engage with. And we are incredibly fortunate to be such a pervasive brand, such an important part of culture. And we said this at the at the at the start of this that our partners are in this with us. And so the more that we can see, know and meaningfully engage, whether that's in our channels and partner channels, but in ways that ultimately drive up their fandom and their engagement with the sport and with the, with the, with the NFL. That's a great thing for fandom. That's a great thing for us. That's awesome. What a great way to wrap this discussion. It has been, I, it has been such a pleasure for me and for Rich to get to spend this time with you. It has been a pleasure to be a partner with you guys on the journey. I am grateful for your time. And for all of you who have joined uh, joined us on the interwebs, um, this is the final Transform, Rinse, Repeat episode for this year. Our next one will be in January, on January 26th. And so on behalf of Andy, Paul, Rich, myself, wish you happy holidays. Thank you for joining. And we hope you have a great day. Thank you. And everyone tune into Thank the you. game tonight. That's right. <laughs> See you guys. Bye.